Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ISTH webinar series. My name is Raj Kasturi, and I'm Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I will be moderating today's webinar. Today, we will be discussing platelet function testing with Drs. Paolo Graselli and Neil Morgan. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to review a few technical details and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, and we encourage you to submit questions to our presenters using the questions tab on the left side of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. We will be monitoring questions and will try to respond more quickly if we see something that shouldn't wait until the Q&A period. For example, if you're having technical issues or need clarifications. When posting your questions, please specify which speaker you would like to address the question to. For those of you who wish to take notes during the presentation, you can do this by clicking on the Notes tab on the right-hand side of the screen. You will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. If you're interested in a PDF copy of the PowerPoint presentations, you can click on the Resources tab on the left-hand side of the player. Once there, you can click on the file names to initiate the download. Finally, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you can click on the Request Support button in the lower left of the player, and we will have a technical expert to help you out with whatever problems you may have. That's it for housekeeping issues, so let's get started. First up is Dr. Paolo Graselli. Dr. Graselli is Professor of Internal Medicine and Cardiovascular Medicine at the University of Perugia in Italy. Dr. Griselli will be discussing platelet function assays. Dr. Griselli, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Raji. Uh, uh, good day, everybody from Perugia, Italy. My task today is uh, to discuss the platelet function assays within the larger topic of the platelet function testing in the clinic. The interest in, in the platelet function assays has been growing steadily over the last few years with the increase in the potential applications of the platelet function assays in the clinic. So uh, many more new tests have been uh, uh, added to the, to the previously known tests with a number of uh, point-of-care devices, especially which have been introduced in the clinical use in the last few years. The possible applications of the platelet function assays in the clinic are here listed, and they are the diagnosis of platelet function defects, the detection of uh, antiplatelet antibodies, the detection of uh, circulating activated platelets, the study of platelet hyperreactivity, uh, one very large topic that has uh, attracted a lot of, of interest over the last few years is the monitoring of antiplatelet therapy uh, using uh, platelet function assays, and uh, especially also the interest in the monitoring of uh, patients under antiplatelet therapy who have to undergo uh, uh, inter uh, intervention. And the and last potential application is the evaluation of platelets prepared for transfusion medicine, so for uh, uh, platelet banking for the quality of the platelet concentrate used for transfusion medicine. Uh, I will just concentrate on one single topic uh, uh, given the, the general uh, aim of today's webinar, which is the application of the platelet function assays for the diagnosis of platelet function defects and especially for the diagnosis of inherited platelet function disorders. So let's first just define what are inherited platelet function disorders. These are a heterogeneous group of rare congenital hemorrhagic disorders uh, with normal or usually mildly reduced platelet number but unaltered platelet function. These forms are associated with mucocutaneous bleeding diathesis which may be of variable in severity and which for most of the forms is usually mild. These are largely heterogeneous in terms of uh, molecular genetic defect and still many forms of inherited platelet function disorder do not have an identified 
molecular and genetic defects. There is not yet a consensus on, on the classification of the inherited pleasant function disorders, but I have reported here a working classification which may be useful to understand the application of the assays for their diagnosis in the, in the uh, uh, subsequent part of my talk. And this uh, working classification is adapted from a review article written a few years ago by Marco Cattaneo. And they, the inherited pleasant function disorder may be divided in these groups, uh, adhesive protein receptor defect. So the, these uh, the conditions in which a major uh, platelet surface uh, uh, receptor which binds to adhesive proteins is lacking. And these are essentially the receptors for von Willebrand factor, for fibrinogen, and for collagen. And these are the bernard soulier syndrome, which is a loss of function uh, mutation of the complex GP1B95, which binds von Willebrand factor, and the, the platelet type von Willebrand disease, which is a condition of gain of function mutation uh, of the same receptor. Glansman thrombastinia and its variants, which are forms in which the receptor for fibrinogen, the integrin alpha 2b beta 3, is defective. And then there are a number of uh, more rare conditions associated with uh, specific de defects of uh, specific receptors for collagen, like alpha 2 beta 1, GP6, and GP4. Then there is a group which are the soluble agonist receptor defects, which are uh, all those conditions in which a uh, receptor for an agonist, uh, uh, soluble agonist of platelet activation is defective. And, and the most uh, important, the most known of these are the P2Y12 receptor for ADP and its thromboxin receptor, the TT receptor defect. Then there are uh, uh, another group of conditions which are considered pretty frequent among the inherited platelet function disorders, which are the defect of platelet granular content, and this may be the defect of alpha granules, which is mainly the gray platelet syndrome, defect of delta granules, which is the delta storage pool disease, or the more rare condition of an associated defect of both types of granules. There is then a miscellaneous group of disorders, which are the disorder of the signaling pathways, which are activated during platelet activation, and then there are some very rare forms which are the defects of membrane phospholipids. Actually, are those conditions in which the procoagulant activity of platelets is uh, altered uh, with a loss of function condition, with a, which is the Scott syndrome, and a gain of function condition, which is the Storm-Morgan syndrome. And finally, there is a, a, a miscellaneous group which are the primary secretion defects, which is a not well-defined group of uh, disorders, pretty frequent in which the granular content of platelets is defective, but the secretion of the granular content uh, is, uh, is defective while the granular content is normal. So the platelet function assays are uh, many disparate, uh, disparate uh, uh, types of assays. I have grouped them here in, in groups uh, which um, are listed as the global test of platelet function, which are uh, characterized by the fact that they assess the platelet function in all blood, so in the presence of all the other cellular species present in blood, and uh, which uh, and uh, and by the fact that the the activation of the platelets uh, takes place by the interaction with the, the subendothelium or a subendothelian component, and in condition of blood flow. Then there are the platelet aggregation tests, which evaluate by different methods the ability of platelets to clump together. The, the first and the most known is the light transmission aggregometry, but in the last few years, many new tests have added, and among them, there are many point-of-care devices which are used mainly for the monitoring of the effect of antiplatelet agent. Then there are the tests which study platelet activation induced by high shear stress, so in the absence, usually, of a platelet agonist. And uh, then there is flow cytometry, which is a technique which allows to study many different functions of platelets, so it's a very versatile uh, uh, methodology. Then it is possible to study platelet-soluble markers of activation, and then it's possible to study the urinary markers of platelet activation. 
I will just mention a few of these methods, concentrating on those which are most uh, uh, useful for the diagnosis of inherited pleasure function disorders. Well, the first one is the skin bleeding time, which is the most antique uh, test for the study of hemostasis ever described. It dates back to over one century ago, and it has evolved uh, in order to be more standardized to the method which is used nowadays, which is described in the cartoon. Actually, the test uh, studies the time taken for a wound inflicted on a, on a forearm, usually, to stop and uh, is, is uh, uh, in principle a simple test uh, which is altered in patients with inherited with platelet function disorders, but it may be altered in a number of other conditions, including thrombocytopenia, von Willebrand disease, acquired platelet function disorder, in some special blood clotting disorder or connective tissue disorder, and is affected by many different drugs. The advantages of this test is that it is the only diagnostic test which assesses platelet function in vivo. It is simple, it is fast, it is a potentially a bedside test, does not imply sample manipulation. It assesses platelet function in the presence of all the cellular components involved, and it assesses platelet function under flow condition. However, it has many disadvantages because it has a very low reproducibility it has a wide variation in the normal range. It requires a skilled technician in order to be uh, uh, performed. It is strongly influenced by many different variables, which are here listed. And it is uh, finally an invasive test, which may also leave scars. So it is uh, uh, no longer much used, although several laboratories still adopt it. The other very widely diffused test is the platelet function analyzer uh, 100. A new version is now called platelet function analyzer 200, uh, which is a test which tries to mimic in vitro the uh, primary hemostasis uh, processes. Uh, actually, the test uh, measures the time taken for uh, a blood uh, a clot, uh, essentially a platelet plaque, to uh, occlude a small uh, opening in a filter uh, under very uh, control uh, shear condition, flow condition. And uh, the uh, membrane in which the opening is made is covered by platelet activity substances, usually collagen, ADP, and collagen epinephrine. The test is altered the inherited platelet function disorder, but also in another, a number of other conditions, like von Willebrand disease, acquired platelet function disorder, pregnancy, liver cirrhosis, and stage left, renal failure and cardiopulmonary bypass. It has several potential advantages. It is simple and rapid. It is almost uh, semi-automatic. It is less expensive than the bleeding time. It works with anticoagulated blood. It doesn't require technical skill and it may uh, be performed on, on samples which are preserved for, our, for up to four to five hours. And it is rather, rather fast to perform, but it, is, it has several disadvantages as it is influenced by many different variables which are uh, listed in this slide. Both these tests have been explored for their uh, uh, ability to identify patients with inherited platelet function disorder. This is an example of a study carried out by Quiroga and Diego Mezzano in Chile, in which 148 patients with uh, new cutaneous bleeding in a positive family history were studied with the two tests. And what happened is that the sensitivity of the two tests to identify these patients with a, a, a bleeding disorder was pretty low, and especially for the preterist secretion disorder, it was 43% for the bleeding time and 24% only for the PFA 100, and the correlation between the two tests was very low. And uh, the Subcommittee uh, on Platelet Physiology of the ISTH established a working group a few years ago to assess and made recommendation on the clinical use for the diagnosis of PFA 100, and especially for the inherited platelet function disorder, it turned out from the review of the literature that the patients studied were relatively few and with very variable results, with normal or prolonged closure time in the, uh, in the, in the PFA 100, 
and the sensitivity in the different studies which range from 24 to 80%. Based on these results, the recently issued uh, guidance uh, on the diagnosis of inherited platelet function disorder by the SSC on platelet physiology of the SDH has uh, decided that the PSA 100 and the plate skin bleeding time should not be recommended for the diagnosis of inherited platelet function disorder because of their poor diagnostic accuracy and low sensitivity, although they may be used as an optional test in single laboratories if a stringent cutoff threshold is applied. Let's go to the next big group of tests, and let's speak about the main test, which is light transmission aggregometry. is a test described over 50 years ago by Gustav Born and, and John O'Brien independently, and the basic principle is that uh, we measure the increase of light transmission through a suspension of platelets during the formation of a platelet clamp. Uh, the test uh, uh, has uh, several advantages because the readout is much more complex and uh, informative than the test that we have described before. Uh, you may test, uh, you may use different agonists to induce platelet aggregation, different concentrations of each agonist, and you may interpret the results based on the shape of the platelet aggregation curves. This is an example taken from our own experience, from our laboratory, of the application of light transmission aggregometry to the diagnosis of many different uh, inherited platelet function disorders, and you see that there are typical patterns depending on the agonist you use. In glansman thrombasthenia, which is the second row, you see that there is no aggregation with any of the agonists used except ristocetin, which induces agglutination of platelets by the interaction between GP1V and von Willebrand factor. The opposite is for the bernard sulier syndrome, in which you have aggregation, normal aggregation with all the agonists, which induce aggregation by binding fibrinogen to B2B3A, 2 B2 while there is no uh, agglutination whatsoever induced by ristocytin. The storage pool deficiency, another very frequent condition for inherited platelet function disorder, is characterized by the absence of a second wave of aggregation to epinephrine and ADP, a reduced aggregation to collagen, normal aggregation to ristocytin, and the effects of the thromboxin pathway, which are also pretty frequent, are characterized by a complete absence of arachidonic acid-induced aggregation and absent second wave by, uh, uh, induced by epinephrine and ADP. Although light transmission aggregometry is very useful and informative, there are conditions in which you may have a defective platelet secretion with normal aggregation. And this has been established in several studies. This is an, uh, studies. This is an example of a study of several years ago in which 106 patients with delta storage pool deficiency were studied with uh, different tests. And uh, you may see that despite these patients had a prolonged bleeding time and a clearly reduced content of uh, the dense granules, ADP and serotonin, in several of them, which are the open dots, uh, platelet aggregation by light transmission aggregometry was absolutely normal. So this means that it's very important to study platelet secretion, and uh, uh, platelet secretion is, is a pretty complex phenomenon. Platelets contain three different types of granules, which are the lysosome, the delta granules, and the alpha granules. The alpha granules contain proteins, and among these there are some platelet-specific proteins like PF4 and beta thromboglobulin, and some proteins like P-selecting, which, which are not only platelet-specific, but which have the characteristics that once they are, uh, they are released by the activated platelet, they stick on the platelet membrane and can be measured on the platelet surface. The dense granular content is mainly made by ATP, ADP, serotonin, all substances which contribute to expand and, and potentiate the platelet aggregation phenomenon, calcium and polyphosphate. And then the lysosome contains several proteins and enzymes. So it's very important and crucial to study platelet secretion. And the methods used for the study of platelet secretion have, be, have been recently reviewed by Andrew Manford, Diego Mezzano, and the Platelet Physiology uh, uh, Subcommittee of the ICH with a publication which is EPAP now in thrombosis and hemostasis. 
and are listed here as quantitative assays for specific granule components, quantitative and semi-quantitative assays for non-specific platelet granule components, functional testing of the secreted platelet component, and some surrogate indirect assessment of the platelet secretion defect. The most important and most used among these uh, uh, platelet secretion parameters are the measurement, the measurement of ADP and ATP uh, by different methods, the, met the measurement of serotonin 5-HT release for the dense granules, and the measurement of platelet factor 4 beta thromboglobulin or the measurement of platelet membrane P-selecting by flow cytometry for the measurement of alpha granule component. And uh, some other surrogate methods are the use of transmission electron microscopy, immune electron microscopy, and uh, uh, immune fluorescence confocal microscopy. One simple method which is quite widely diffused for the assessment of the platelet secretion is Lumia aggregometry. Lumia aggregometry uh, associates the method of light transmission aggregometry with the ability to measure the uh, secretion of ATP uh, by the uh, reaction between ATP and luciferin luciferase, which are added to the sample. This interaction generates light, and light is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, registered, and you may have a, a contemporaneous uh, registration of the light transition aggregometry uh, tracing and of the ATP secretion tracing. Using this simple method, you can measure simultaneously secretion and aggregation. And by exploiting the use of different agonists, you can identify uh, an inherited platelet function disorder at least at the pathway level. This means that the disorders, by using an array, a simple array of platelet agonists, can be divided in GI-like defects. So defects of the pathway started essentially by ADP and adrenaline and leading to platelet aggregation and also to secretion. In uh, dense granule defects in which the secretion defect prevails, in thromboxane pathway defects, which are started by uh, arachidonic acid uh, uh, triggering the synthesis of thromboxane A2, and then there may be GQ-like defect or defect of the GP6 pathway. Using this kind of approach, the group of Dawood and co-workers recently have carried out a study in, in 111 subjects with suspected inherited platelet function disorder, 64 of which came out to be uh, abnormal, and the patients were clearly classified in this group. So patients with a defect in GI signaling, specific pattern in uh, platelet dysfunction, uh, platelets with a uh, dense granule defect, which was the second group in terms of frequency, around 30% of all the cases, and platelets with a defect in the thromboxane generation. The last technique I would like to speak about is flow cytometry, which is a technique which has many interesting advantages because it may use very small sample volume, a very short time of analysis, the possibility is to study platelets in all blood, so in their own natural environment, and the possibility to study platelet characteristics and function in thrombocytopenic patients, including the possibility to study many different functions with this single uh, technique. The disadvantage is that it's an expensive, technically complex technique which lacks standardization and needs the processing of blood uh, rather soon after blood collection. Despite of this uh, limitation, flow cytometry is very much used in the platelet laboratories. These are the results of a worldwide survey that we carried out uh, last year uh, in uh, around 200 laboratories uh, studying uh, platelets uh, uh, around the world, and you see that 57% uh, uh, of them use flow cytometry. Flow cytometry is now the golden standard for the diagnosis of some uh, specific uh, inherited platelet function disorder. This is an example from our group of a diagnosis of glansman thrombastenia, and you see how the tracing for the binding of antibodies to GP2B3A and GP3A is very much uh, reduced as compared to a control. 
You may also study some form of acquired gland and thrombostenia by carrying out mixing tests with controlled platelets and patient serum and showing that patient serum may reduce the binding of antibodies directed versus uh, GP2B3A. You may also diagnose platelet type von Willebrand disease, which is a condition in which you have an increased affinity of GP1B for von Willebrand factor, and you simply uh, and rapidly observe a very strikingly increased binding of von Willebrand factor induced by low concentrations of uh, risk-seeking using this technique, and you may differentiate making uh, mixing tests this kind of platelet disorder from type 2B von Willebrand disease in which the same kind of phenotype is generated by an alteration of von Willebrand factor. In, in, in fact, when you mix platelet plasma, platelets from the patient with the uh, uh, patient plasma, you don't change the pattern in type 2 von Willebrand disease while you do induce an increase in the binding of, of uh, von Willebrand in normal platelets with mixing with type 2B von Willebrand disease. I said, and I'm close to concluding, uh, I said that uh, one limitation of flow cytometry is uh, the fact that you have to process blood soon after uh, taking it, but recently a fixing uh, medium has been developed that allows to study uh, platelets uh, uh, even uh, a few days after blood collection. And this has been uh, adopted to see whether uh, remote platelet function testing can be carried out, so whether uh, samples can be collected, uh, uh, stimulated, fixed, and analyzed in a centralized laboratory remote from the place where the blood uh, was taken. And in this study, it was shown that by adopting some agonists and two markers of platelet activation, P-selecting expression and CD63 expression, platelet uh, function disorder can be diagnosed. Finally, I just want to show what are the guidelines that were generated for the rational approach to the diagnosis of platelet function disorder. Who should be studied? Patients with a history of mucocutaneous bleeding, familiar or not, for whom? An acquired or drug-induced cause of platelet dysfunction was excluded. Patients for whom the following condition have been excluded, acquired thrombocytopenia, von Willebrand disease, blood clot in the fat, and fibrinogenemia. The patient should undergo a first clinical evaluation with physical examination and a very careful personal and family, family history, and possibly the, the assessment of the bleeding diathesis by the bleeding score. Then, if this shows that there is a clinical suspicion of inherited platelet function disorder, then there a preliminary laboratory investigation must be performed, platelet count, routine coagulation tests, von Willebrand screening. If these exclude other diagnoses, then the patient should undergo a list of platelet function tests, which should be organized in a logical way. And the first step test include, besides blood smear, for the measurement of platelet size and morphological alteration, light transmission aggregometry with a few very clearly identified agonists, flow cytometry with uh, uh, antibodies against the GPW3A and GP1B complex, and some tests for the measurement of granular release. Uh, this allows the diagnosis of an, a lot of conditions, which, which I cannot list and that I refer to the paper recently published in the Journal of Thrombosis and Mostasis. In a second step, if the first step has not allowed the diagnosis, you may add some uh, further agonists to light transmission aggregometry, some further antibodies to flow cytometry. You may study granular content. You may carry out clot retraction and serum thromboxin, which can be measured in the same sample, and you may uh, perform transmission electron microscopy. Here, too, you may diagnose a further group of platelet disorders that I refer to uh, for the paper in during thrombosis and mostasis. And finally, for those rare conditions in which the first two steps have not allowed the diagnosis, you may go into more deep and complex studies which are reserved to uh, specialized laboratories. In this way, we have estimated that you may uh, reach a diagnosis in 40% of cases at the first step, another 40, 42% at the second step. We may diagnose uh, the other patients in the last step. I would stop here 
Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, we can go back to some of the points I discussed possibly during, my discuss during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Criselli. As a reminder, we will address all questions after both talks have concluded. Let us now proceed to our next speaker, Dr. Neil Morgan. Dr. Morgan is lecturer in the cardiovascular in cardiovascular genetics in the School of Clinical and Experimental Medicine at the University of Birmingham, UK. His topic is genetics of platelet disorders. Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Raj. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And secondly, I would like to thank Paolo for an excellent overview of platelet function test in the laboratory. So my talk today will focus on the genetics of platelet function disorders and what we can currently do once platelet phenotyping has been performed. So what causes bleeding? So there are many different causes of bleeding in patients. They often appear as a hemostatic challenge, such as surgery or childbirth. Genetic components exist which will form the basis of my talk, and bleeding can as result due to skin problems, such as collagen, numerous medications, blood tests, environmental factors, such as the patient's diet or alcohol intake, injury, and many additional factors. Inherited platelet disorders are rare, and there are currently over 1,400 patients um, registered with the U United Kingdom Haemophilia Centre Doctors Association, those that are having a platelet disorder other than Glanzmann's thrombosthenia and Bernoulli disease. An additional 280 patients are registered as miscellaneous or uncla unclassifiable. So platelet function disorders are rare. Around 1 in 10,000 inherited thrombocytopenia is the estimated um, incidence. Although rare, it's heavily underdiagnosed and likely to be much more common. Um, Glanzmann's thrombosthenia is a well-known severe bleeding disorder with an estimated incidence of one in a million. So in our experience in laboratory, around 60% of patients with a clinically diagnosed platelet defect have impaired functional responses. So you may ask, so why are platelet function disorders so rare and mostly associated with a mild form of bleeding? Well, there's redundancy of the platelet receptor and the signaling pathways, and we have an excess number of platelets. With most platelet disorders, we think they're more likely to be multifactorial, and this makes diagnosis of a platelet disorder a huge challenge. So the complex nature, nature of diagnosing a platelet disorder is outlined here. So what happened here was a 14-year-old man was referred with a long history of severe nosebleeds, Platelet aggregation studies showed an abnormal response to intermediate concentrations of arachidonic acid and an abnormal response to um, the COX inhibitor U4619. DNA sequencing was carried out in this patient, and this went on to identify a heterozygous amino acid change in the seven transmembrane region of the receptor. We went on to show that this disrupted um, receptor function. However, the patient's father upon testing who passed down the, the mutation was shown not to have a bleeding history, hence the complex nature of diagnosing a platelet disorder on the genetics alone. So the role of multiple genes in the same patient is illustrated here. So in von Willebrand disease, which is the most common bleeding disorder described in about 1% of the population, the, pat the pattern of bleeding is similar to patients with platelet function disorders, both showing incomplete penetrance. A study looking for mutations in the platelet type ADP PTY12 receptor in a cohort of patients with type 1 von Willebrand disease, they found mutations in the PTY, y, PTY12 gene, which is shown here. I'll come back to some of these mutations later on in the talk. So to summarize this part, so, so here the majority of platelet gene mutations associated with platelet dysfunction are in fact risk factors for bleeding, Exceptions include patients or families where there is a clear autosomal recessive or dominant inheritance. So I'll focus on these such families and inheritance patterns for the rest of the talk. So if you look at the inherited platelet disorders, they can be classified into distinct groups. So these include defects in platelet adhesion, defects in platelet receptors, secretion defects, 
which can consist of alpha granule or dense granule deficiencies and disorders of the cytoskeleton. There are also disorders of the coagulation activity, such as uh, Scott syndrome and platelet signaling defects. So if we look at platelet de defects in more detail, we can see the majority of inherited platelet disorders fall into the following categories, as I said on the previous slide. The platelet adhesion, disorders such as platelet type 1 Villebrand disease, which is a dominant disorder with mutations in the GP1BA gene. Mutations in this gene result in enhanced affinity for von Willebrand factor. Another well-known disorder is Bernatule syndrome, which is also an adhesion defect, which is transmitted in an autosome recessive manner, and patients are homozygous or compound heterozygous, the GPA1BA, GP1BB, or GP9 genes. Platelet aggregation defects exist, which consist of recessive mutations in either ADP collagen and the thrombin, thr sorry, thromboxane A2 receptor, receptors. Glantrum's thrombocenia is due to deficiency of the platelet type GP2B, GP3A complex. And then there's a whole host of platelet excretion defects, which are a heterogeneous group of disorders associated with a normal presence or contents of the platelet um, granules. This results in a mild to moderate bleeding diathesis. So some well-known disorders are these are Mansky's Pudlak syndrome, which is a rare and heterogeneous disorder, which is um, inherited in recessive uh, manner with oculocutaneous albinism and the absence of platelet-dense granules. In all, nine genes that have been identified today in humans. Grave platelet syndrome is a rare recessive disorder of platelets and megakaryocytes and characterized by moderate thrombocytopenia with this time the absence of alpha granules. Disorders of the platelet cytoskeleton include a group of disorders with MYH9 mutations with large platelets and doli like inclusions in their neutrophils. Platelet coagulation activity can cause a syndrome called um, Scott syndrome, which is a bleeding disorder in which the activated platelets have a strongly impaired capacity to expose PS and to result in um, stimulate the prothrombinase and tenase activity or defect then. Congenital thrombocytopenias were once considered very rare conditions, but now considered recognized with increased frequency, some of which I will mention later on in this talk. So with all these types of platelet defects in mind, this algorithm taken from this review gives a guide to the systematic interpretation of these laboratory assays. So this underlies the complexity of DNA diagnosis and which genes to consider first for gene sequencing. So first of all, Sanger sequencing. So once we have phenotyped these patients, both in clinical terms and by platelet function testing, how do we go about identifying gene mutations? So firstly, Sanger sequencing can be guided by platelet phenotyping, as Paolo was mentioned, such as LUMI aggregometry, which may identify ADP or thromboxane receptor defects, for example. This platelet phenotyping study was taken from the genotyping and phenotyping of platelet study, or GAP study. An analysis of a large number of patients with a history of bleeding identified a defect in platelet function in 60% of patients. So these could be further sub subdivided on the pattern of the responses. Collectively, over 70% of patients displayed impairment in either a dense granule secretion defect, GI receptor signaling, or arachidonic acid metabolism defects. Thus, this platelet phenotyping provides a basis to follow up candidate gene sequencing. So one of the findings of the GAP project is shown here. A homozygous mutation was reported in the ADP PTY12 receptor, and this was found in the 30 year old female whose parents were cousins. She required blood transfusions following two pregnancies. Her brother suffered from prolonged bleeding after a minor injury, also. Her platelets underwent shape change, and transient aggregation response to a high concentration of ADP and showed normal biphasic aggregation response to adrenaline. The mutation found upon sequencing was a frame shift deletion, which was shown to prevent receptor expression. 
So luminar gyrotometry in this case was also applied to another patient, in this case identified absent ATP secretion shown on the tray. So this was found in a 77-year-old lady with albinism and visual defects, but also a strong history of bleeding. So we went on to use autologosity mapping since her parents were related, and this was done to guide the sequencing to the HBS7 gene. Upon sequencing, this was the second reported case of mutation in the Hermansky Pudlak 7 gene, the homozygous nonsense mutation shown here in the electropherogram. So, moving on from candidate gene sequencing, the use of next generation sequencing greatly reduces the time needed to identify such gene mutations. So, this was clearly illustrated by the identification of the recessive mutation in the new beaching like 2 gene as a causative gene for grey platelet syndrome. Next generation sequencing, or whole exome sequencing more specifically, sequences all protein coding genes in the human genome and accounts for about 1% of the total human genome. On the left, you can see that the exome sequencing workflow, where genomic DNA is first fragmented, linkers are then attached to the DNA fragments, and then these are then hybridized to a capture microarray designed to target only the exons. In the second step, targets, target exons are enriched and then amplified by ligation-mediated PCR. Amplified target DNA is then ready for high-throughput sequencing using these sequences shown on the right, such that a whole genome now can be sequenced in a matter of days. So once the date, raw data is generated, the really difficult task is identifying the culprit gene. Here we see a typical analysis pipeline, which needs a great deal of bioinformatics support. Once a list of candidate genes are generated, we can interrogate each variant more closely. So in this example, I've shown a rung swan variant in a patient that we identified with inherited from cytopenia. So using the IGV or integrative genomics viewer, based in the Broad Institute, we can assess the coverage of the variant, which gives an indication of the sequence quality shown here. So each one is a sequence read, each line. In this case, a total of 21 sequence reads is shown. It's split into 12 with a C nucleotide base and 9 with a T nucleotide base. This is typical of the heterozygous mutation, which we would go on to confirm using traditional Sanger sequencing that I've already mentioned. So we can use um, next generation sequencing in patients and families with all types of inheritance. Exome sequencing has been shown to be particularly successful in consanguineous families where we look for homozygous variants which are identical by descent from a common ancestor. All exome sequencing has been shown successful in several studies with a dominantly inherited platelet disorder, which I will give an example of later on in this talk. And finally, it is also possible to identify a cause of genetic variants in isolated patients or those with sporadic disease, but the key here is that they have to be extremely well phenotyped. So first of all, with um, using next generation sequencing in consanguineous families. So here's an example that whole exome sequence has been used and applied to two, two affected cousins from a consanguineous family. They had a severe inherited thrombosy thrombocytopenia, both patients having a platelet count of around 20 times 10 to the 9 per litre of blood and therefore requiring frequent platelet transfusions. From the exome sequencing, we typically see in these two patients around 25,000 total sequence variants. And as the two patients are cousins, we can filter for homozygous variants only. These can be further reduced by filtering against sequence databases like those shown below. We are then left with only eight variants shared between the two patients, which can be sequenced in further family members. So eventually, we identify the most likely candidate variant. In this case, it's found to be a homozygous three-base pair deletion in the anchoring repeat domain 18A gene, which is a novel protein of unknown function. So I, I will now go on to give an example where NGS has been used to identify gene defects in families with a dominant mode of inheritance. 
So here we see a family with inherited bleeding disorder with a clear dominant mode of inheritance. Upon platelet phenotyping, the affected mother and daughter both showed reduced platelet dense granule secretion, shown here. Here we see a second family, which also has a dominant mode of inheritance and also a secretion defect, like in the first family. So we use a panel of 260 platelet genes to find the cause of the mutation. The strategy used was to filter the NGS data of pairs of first degree relatives from two families showing similar phenotypes. So through the various filter steps, we were able to identify two heterozygous non synonymous alterations, in this case in the FLY1 gene. FLY1 gene has already been shown to be involved in parastrusal syndrome caused by 11Q23-24 deletion that encompasses the FLY1 gene. Patients generally have an increased tendency to bleed, thrombocytopenia, and large platelets with giant alpha granules. FLY1 is a member of the ETS family of transcription factors that regulates genes expressed during megacarocytopoiesis. Both of the fly missense mutations found in our two patients were substitutions found in the highly conserved DNA binding domain shown here in the slide, and subsequent in vitro studies showed that the mutation significantly reduced the fly one transcription activity. The same study went on to detect further fly one mutations in patients and also in the RUNX1 gene. Both FLY1 and RUNX1 are transcription factors essential for megacaryocytopoiesis. These genes may account for a significant portion of patients with platelet granule secretion defects and mild bleeding symptoms. So we can also um, identify causative genes in patients with inherited bleeding where there be multiple genes involved, but this is a very difficult task and there's no current document evidences of this by use of next generation sequencing. So how do we know whether mutations are actually functionally disrupted or simply polymorphisms? So we clearly still need to do the cell biology on these to prove their defective function. So here's an example of two mutations in the ATP PTY12 receptor which we found in two separate patients with the type 1 von Willebrand disease. So the K174E mutation shown on the, on the top half of the slide is located near the clopidogrel binding site. The P341 mutation is found in the C-terminal PTZ binding domain. So if we take the patient with the K174E mutation first, agrogometry showed reduced and reversible aggregation in response to 10 micromolar ADP. This defect was further investigated by showing that in CHO cells, or Chinese hamster ovary cells, stably expressing HA tagged and wild type variant PTY12 receptors, that there was markedly reduced binding to radiolabeled ADP. Thus, this confirmed the functional consequence of this mutation. The other mutation is a heterozygous mutation of a proline to alanine at the amino acid position 341, the PTZ binding domain of the PTY12 receptor. Cell line studies again show that this prevents recycling the receptor back to the membrane following the exposure to ADP and is therefore associated with reduced first surface expression of the receptor in this patient and accounts for its bleeding. So clearly, next generation sequencing is the future. But whether we use targeted arrays using a panel of, of selection of candidate genes or go for the whole genome-wide approach in the form of whole exome sequencing or, genome, or whole genome sequencing, in fact. Whole genome sequencing is becoming the method of choice, it seems, as costs have dramatically fallen recently. The challenge is identifying that culprit genome mutation from the list of variants you will get. So to bring you right up to date within the UK, a new government initiative has been funded to sequence up to 100,000 whole genomes in patients. This includes rare diseases, some of which will be inherited bleeding disorders such as the ones I've described today. The first phase of this project is underway. 
So finally, I will conclude with a few points. Firstly, I would say that genetic testing may help the clinical management of patients with inherited bleeding disorder. Secondly, the identification of genetic variants may elucidate novel functions of a particular proteins or the proteins and their pathway. It may even identify novel drug targets for the prevention of thrombosis. Just a final thought is that we need to be careful when assigning a particular mutation to a patient. It often needs further phenotypic support, as I've shown today in some of the patients. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, we will now begin the question and answer session, and um, there are quite a few questions, and um, I I'm going to get started uh, with Dr. Griselli first. Um, could you comment on the difference between the PFA 100 and the 200? Along those lines, is there a P2Y12 cartridge available for PFA 100 testing? Uh, well, the difference is essentially a technical evolution in the in the PFA 200 uh, versus the PFA 100. So, it's the hardware that, in some way, has been improved. But in terms of the principle of the method and of readout, is essentially the same. The P2Y uh, cartridge is available. And uh, it has some uh, theoretical potentials also for what we are talking about today, so the diagnosis of inherited bladder function disorder, because it can be used uh, in principle for the identification of uh, uh, defects in the P2Y12 receptors. Uh, there is uh, uh, initial experience with that, but it's not sufficiently large for the moment to advise the use of this, uh, of this test on a, on a, on a uh, widespread basis. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question in regards to platelet function testing. What is the gold standard for LTA? Is it PRP or whole blood analysis? For light transmission aggregometry, you need to work with a transparent uh, uh, suspension of platelets. So you, you may use only either PRP, platelet-rich plasma, or washed platelets in a buffer. All blood can be used in, in aggregometry only using the impedance aggregometer, which, you, which uses another principle, which is the uh, difference in the transmission of an electric potential uh, between two electrodes which are immersed in the all blood sample. Like, uh, the impedance aggregometer has been uh, applied to the uh, diagnosis of uh, inherited platelet function disorders, but the experience is very limited. And uh, so far, there is no real evidence that it offers advantages over light transmission aggregometry. And given that light transmission aggregometry is much, is much more widespread and there is much more experience with that, I would say that the gold standard is light transmission aggregometry with PRP. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Morgan, question for you. Uh, with advances in technology, do you think that we will be able to identify the, uh, or better identify and diagnose the significant portion of people who currently are classified as having a bleeding of unknown cause with currently existing uh, diagnostic approaches? Thank you for the question. Um, I do think as the technology advances, we will be able to. I think the limiting factor at the moment in teasing out that culprit mutation or gene is is to actually um, use the available databases, subtract all the ones that are not not mutations. Um, I think we're getting to a stage where we can eventually, but obviously, in the in the patients where there's a clearly a family history, that's we're finding that's a lot easier. But the more, like I say, the more isolated, sporadic forms of disease is is a bit more tricky. Um, yeah, so I think it points down to the the databases being um, updated and the more individuals we sequence, such as the 100,000 genome products, the better the data can be analyzed from the plat various platforms that we use. One more question to you, Dr. Morgan. Um, does your lab accept external requests or samples for genetic testing? If so, in what anticoagulant and how should the samples be processed? Um, I mean, at the moment, we're certainly um, able to accept samples from, from the UK, within the UK. We just um, started kind of offering um, some, some testing on a research basis um, 
from some labs in Europe. Obviously, it requires an MTA. I mean, it all depends really where the, where the patients are coming from. Um, in terms of the, um, the blood sample, um, it's usually, um, we would normally start with doing the platelet phenotyping first anyway with citrated blood. And then the, the platelet phenotyping will direct us to the, what sequencing we do. But we will collect um, DNA at the same time from the Buffy coat of that blood sample. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Griselli, uh, can you comment on cheaper tabletop flow cytometers and their role in uh, platelet function analysis? I don't have any personal experience with these, but uh, I believe that in principle they should be able to help in, in the diagnosis of an erythroid function disorder because the basic test, uh, I believe, that should be possibly carried out with these um, more simple new generation flow cytometers. Okay. Um, one question on the agonists that are used for platelet function testing. Could you comment on whether epinephrine is truly an agonist, um, that's one. And the other question is, is there a role for platelet nucleotide testing in, in the setting of us being able to do secretion analysis with Lumi aggregometry today? So the, the first question is, is a very interesting and very complex one. It is a very much debated issue. So whether uh, epinephrine is a real full agonist or is simply a, a substance which primes platelets for the stimulation by other agonists. Uh, the fact is that uh, epinephrine has a specific receptor on the platelet surface, which, which is the eight-way receptor. There is no uh, platelet functional defect, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, correlated to inherited effect of the A2A receptor, but uh, uh, the epinephrine is used uh, in the panel of agonists because uh, it, uh, it adds information together with other agonists uh, on what pathway can be uh, involved in the platelet, inherited platelet function defect, as I showed when I mentioned the GI-like pathway defect. Uh, concerning uh, your second question was about the lumia gregometry and ATP nucleotides. Lumia gregometry is, very, is a very widely diffused technique, and if, used, if it is used properly, it helps a lot in the first screening, so it may certainly be of uh, great help. It, it needs to be standardized in, in your laboratory. You must perform uh, uh, your own set of controls, but it may be uh, very much uh, useful for this. Uh, you can, of course, measure ATP release by other methods, including HPLC uh, or luminescence method uh, directly. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Dr. Griselli. Do you believe flow cytometry is necessary if a lab already does lumia aggregometry? Well, I believe that lumia aggregometry is, uh, if carried out uh, according to a very well-defined panel of agonists and concentration of agonists, uh, and you have a very well-standardized uh, normal control panel in your lab, gives you a very great information. But uh, uh, it is, uh, there are a number, a few uh, uh, forms which would escape diagnosis and that uh, you could catch with uh, flow cytometry. This is the reason why in the first step screening uh, that uh, the guidance from the Letter Physiology Subcommittee gave recently, uh, there is also flow cytometry. So I believe that uh, uh, to have a flow cytometer is sure, surely of great help uh, uh, in the diagnosis of uh, inherited platelet function disorders. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Morgan, question for you. When you identify new mutations in genes, how do you go about sharing them? Uh, is there a public repository for these? Um, not at the moment. Um, so at the moment, we, what we do, we test the patients, um, we do the phenotyping and also the genotyping part, the sequencing, and then we generate a report, and then that report is sent back to the, the consultant who relates the information back to the patient. In terms of... Um, sharing the data of the mutation. We, we actually look to publish it first, obviously. There's no 
not currently a, a public laboratory to put these in. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm afraid we're we're out of time and we'll have to end the session now. I want to extend a special thank you to both of our presenters for their time and insight on this important topic. We hope that you found this educational activity enjoyable. When the webinars end, attendees will be directed to an evaluation and quiz where you can be which can be completed for a one hour CME credit. A follow up email will be sent to all attendees when the webinar with the webinar handouts. The email will also include a link to the evaluation and quiz for attendees who cannot complete their CME immediately following the webinar. Our next webinar will be on combining antiplatelet and anticoagulant therapy. This is scheduled for May 27th and will feature Drs. John Eichelboom and Laura Mori. Please see the ISTH website for details and registration. As a reminder, all of the webinar series are available in archive at the website for your reference. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.